Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. I hope all of you had a fruitful Lent through the practice of the virtues and asceticism and a joyful Easter celebration. Journeying with you in this valley of tears, I am Irenaeus, your host. As many of you know, I took a break from social media for Lent to devote myself more fully to my family and the reading of the Fathers in preparation for the last video of the Essence and Energy Distinction series. That video is still in the works and will be for some time, but for now, another opportunity has perked my interest. Several weeks ago, into the Lenten break, a friend directed my attention to a video by Swan Sona. In it, Swan charitably hosts two guests for ecumenical dialogue in regards to the essence and energy distinction. The first guest being Dr. David Bradshaw, and the other being a Dominican friar by the name of Father Tottleben. Both these intellectual giants are esteemed very highly in their respective circles. And it just so happens that Dr. Bradshaw and Father Tottleben both hold positions which I conclude to be less than ideal. Given that both of their positions are wanting by my estimation, I consider this engagement to be a grand opportunity to do something entirely unique for Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. A video review. In preparation for this video, I have saved several timestamps which I will be critiquing. I'll start from the first timestamp and work my way through. But before I start, I just want to say that if you have not watched this dialogue between Dr. Bradshaw and Father Peter, then I recommend you listen to it in full. Though I don't agree with many of their conclusions, nevertheless their conversation is refreshingly cordial and is packed with good material to chew on. So if you haven't checked it out, go do so. All right, let's get started on the review. I'm going to start at the 13 minute mark and work my way through the timestamps. So contradictions between East and West. So where do the debates lie? I think it's a debate in terms of metaphysical explanation. Thomism and Palamism really do have two different metaphysics that simply cannot be assimilated to one another, and both can't be true. Both. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. When considering metaphysical complementation, one must first apprehend what the other interlocutor outside your position is attempting to grasp at, by way of philosophical endeavor. Only then, after understanding both sides, will the target be manifested as harmonizable or not. The idea of harmonizing two metaphysical systems is not a new concept. The first several centuries of the church was molded by Neoplatonists who sought to harmonize Platonic thinking with the art of Aristotelian metaphysics. If, I ask, it's permissible to hold that one is not mutually exclusive of the other, then do we not make room for both? In Augustine's masterful City of God, he condemns the narrow-mindedness of those such as the Porphyrians and the Platonists who believe that one school of thought renders the other void. This give-and-take attitude is not far even from within the walls of Catholic unity. For example, Thomism doesn't exclude Scotism, and Scotism doesn't exclude Thomism. Therefore, Insofar as we hold to the tenets of the faith which, with purity of heart and do not impede upon the core radii of the truth, then one is permitted to be flexible in their metaphysics. So again, we must first understand both sides before setting them in opposition, and then, only after understanding both sides, can we begin to argue whether one excludes the other. So far, this has merely been asserted. So let's continue and see if Father Tottleben is able to give more substance to his thesis. Whatever a divine energy is, it can't be really distinct in the sense of having a different referent from what the divine essence is. Hey, but Father Peter. Issue... Okay. When we were speaking about energies... I think it's important to first establish a clear definition of what the term means prior to theorizing about it. Gregory of Nyssa calls the energy the vital motion of any given essence, which motion discloses it to be this thing rather than that. 
For example, the energy of an intellectual being is intellection. The energy of a thing that senses is sensation. Apart from the essence's essential motion, it is devoid of characteristic that constitutes it. Now, contrary to the position Father Tottleman seems to be arguing against, the energy of God does not have a distinct reference other than the divine essence. In Maximus' second opuscula, following the Cappadocians, he rightly asserts that no energy is separate from that which it discloses. And elsewhere, Maximus quotes St. John Chrysostom as saying, quote, Energy of God is nowhere, not by non-being, but by being beyond time, place, and natures. Close quote. In fact, if one were to read the Tomos of the Palamite Councils, which the listener can listen to in my first video on the essence energy distinction, it would be manifested that the Palamite position is not that the energies have a distinct reference than the divine essence. Essence, qua essence, for Eastern theology, is static and abstract, while the essence qua energy in hypostasis is concrete and interwoven with affirmations and negations. I don't want to go too deep here because I plan to hit this pretty extensively in my next video on the essence energy distinction. Let's continue to the next timestamp. God actually is acting at a distance, whereas since creation is from nothing, uh, there's no need for God to act at a distance, right? There's no need for God to sort of reach out you know, reach out, so to speak, to manifest himself in the world. He just simply, by willing, manifests um, himself to the world. There, there, there doesn't need to be a subject which he acts on. Creation isn't a transient act. It's actually an imminent act of God. Um, okay. Now here I both agree and disagree with Father Tottleben. In Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 2, he articulates a distinction between imminent acts and transitive acts. Following Aristotle, Aquinas believes that God possesses both. Imminent acts are necessary and are such as the processions of the Son and the Holy Spirit, while transitive acts are God's freedom to terminate a product in creation. The procession of the Son from eternity does not necessitate the creation of the world, but the creation of the world necessitates the eternal procession of the Son. Now, it is true that God's acts are formally imminent in the sense that he only needs to will things into being. And perhaps this is all Father Tottleben is putting forth as an argument, in which case I agree with him. Now, when it comes to stretching out to his creatures, it is true that God does this by will, to which the very doctrine in the East on the Logoi seems to safeguard. But the question here isn't simply whether God needs to reach out or not, but rather, does he for our sakes? Is the Incarnation a reaching out? Absolutely. In the Incarnation, the Son's eternal procession from the Father reaches into the created order, terminating in the Blessed Virgin's womb the very same subject who dwells in light unapproachable. God who acts eminently truly and really reached into the economy of salvation by the incarnation of his eternal word. It's true the assumed human nature is a creative product formed from the Blessed Mother's womb. Nevertheless, it shows that God can and has reached out in a certain sense. Let's continue. What does, the, what does uncreated refer to? So sometimes some Palamite, Palamites will talk about the uncreated uh, energies of God as if they were um, contingent, um, contingent aspects of God that come to be and pass away, um, that come to be and pass away in time. Uh, but that sounds very much like something that's created. So... Okay. Here, I'm glad to hear Father Tottleben making a qualification. Notice he said, Some Palamites say, when speaking of the energies, that they themselves are contingent and under time and pass away. There are many Palamites who do not hold to this kind of reading of St. Gregory Palamas. Palamas himself 
being a faithful reader of Maximus the Confessor, knows that God acts from eternity with no succession of time or motions. When Gregory speaks of the uncreated energies passing in time, he is merely resurfacing the language of the divine saint of Nyssa. This is something I'll touch more upon in the next video. But what I will say is this. For Gregory Palamas, whatever is in God is in God substantively. This can be seen most clearly in the 34th of his 150 Caputas. Since the energies, according to Maximus, admit of contraries, and substance does not, God's goodness is substantial. But that substantial goodness cannot be touched by either sensation or intellection, so that what is predicated is predicated of God by the term of his essential motion and not the substance itself. In short, God's motions are spoken of by thought and expressions and come under the rule of contraries interwoven with affirmations and negations. Thus, when Palamas speaks of uncreated energies in the terms of lesser than and greater than, or coming into being and going out of being, he does not speak so in regards to that in God which admits of no contraries, but rather in the creature who receives and diversifies the energies by thought and expression. Now when God touches the intellect by inspiration, this intellect comes under time, since the very recipient compounded of matter and form has quantitative dimensions and both receives and expresses what was seen and heard by succession. Insofar as the term of God's energy is in time, the energy is said to come into time. But Palamas is clear in his triads that every participable has no beginning or end, but pre-exists eternally in God, and that the energies coming into time are as many as, quote, participating beings in which God is indivisibly diversified. which is the distinction between the divine usia and essence, that is, and the divine powers, all right? Um, uh, the word usia does not occur in the New Testament, and certainly this distinction, usia and power, doesn't occur, but it's something that they sort of took over from Hellenistic thought. You can find it in the pseudo-Aristotelian work, De Mundo, um, probably first century BC, maybe first century AD, you can find it in Philo of Alexandria, first century AD. Uh, for Philo, there are two great divine powers, the uh, creative power and the uh, ruling power, and through which, by which God creates and rules the cosmos. And when we refer to God either as Theos, God, or Kyrios, Lord, we're actually naming one of those powers. Theos is the name of the creative power, Curios is the name of the ruling power and the divine. Okay. Here, Dr. Bradshaw is nicely laying out the historical narrative in regards to the two powers of heaven. By way of supplementation, I'd like to add some additional thoughts to consider. Is it true that God named as Lord signifies his dunamis? Yes. I believe this is a fair reading of the patristic fathers. However, it doesn't end there. The Son is named many times by sacred scripture and the fathers as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Maximus does so as well in his 13 answers to Thalassius. Just something to think about. Fox Church um, uh, confirmed this and repeated councils of the church. It was expressing the mainstream of Greek patristic theology. And so if there is a difference between um, Palamas and Aquinas, I would see it really as a difference between uh, the whole Greek patristic tradition and Aquinas. And that I think would be a serious matter. Uh, but that's something we need to talk about further. Uh, anyway, that's just my, my opening uh, pitch, if you will. I'll just add to what Dr. Bradshaw said that I think the issue is deeper than that. I believe and have attempted to demonstrate in my videos that Aquinas was a faithful follower of the Western patrimony, 
Likewise, Gregory Palamas, I believe, was a faithful follower of the Eastern patrimony. So if Palamas and Aquinas cannot come to terms, then I think we have an issue deeper that's at the root. Can we in good conscience say that the West believes something other than what Aquinas taught? I'll let the listener decide on that one. He thinks that the different names of God are refractory names uh, for the divine essence that we derive from the operation. So although they name God, uh, they don't necessarily provide a definition of who he is. Um, and I okay. Father Tottleben, like any skilled Thomas, uses the word refractory to describe the distinct expressions and names that comes about from God's operations. For Aquinas, it's the use of analogical predication that touches something of God without providing a definition of the divine essence. Now, the issue many Palamites have with Aquinas is precisely what Father Tottleben is getting at. It's true that for Aquinas, the names are refractories of the one divine usia. However, analogical predication as a middle way between equivocation and univocal predication is still limping in that it's the lowest on the tier of theological insight. Reasoning from effects to its cause provides the mind with something to latch onto by way of philosophical endeavor. However, Divine realities are not subject to the perceptive powers of the imagination nor the intellect, but solely by the divine gift of faith. The dark cloud that the mystics enter into is above its own ability to climb up by analogies. Unlike analogical predication, which does not touch God, direct perception grants us an immediate influx of divine light which discloses something of God to the creature. For the Palamites, and in fact, for Aquinas as well, analogical predication does not touch the mystical experiences around which these conversations have been instigated. The divinizing spirit's procession into each saint is not theoretical, but experiential, and it's these experiences around which the conversations should be focused. You know, Augustine famously just tells us in the Confessions that he uh, didn't take to Greek as a young boy. Now, apparently, he did learn some Greek uh, at some point later in life because he, he occasionally we use Greek terms. But it doesn't seem that he was ever reading Greek itself uh, extensively you know, at a level of, of linguistic proficiency. If he did... It... Okay. This argument that Dr. Bradshaw is espousing is an argument that is common, one that I hear amongst Orthodox apologetics. To me, this isn't a convincing argument. The reason being is there are several Latin saints who are fluent in both the Latin and Greek tongue. St. Jerome, Boethius, and Marius Victorinus are just a few saints who not only knew Greek fluently, but also held to a similar view of divine simplicity taught by St. Augustine. For this reason, I don't think it's enough to just know the Greek fathers, or I'm sorry, the, the Greek language. But I think one also needs to be familiarized with the historical interaction between the Cappadocians and the Eunomians. I'll also add as a little caveat which I'm sure that Dr. Bradshaw is aware of, namely that Marius Victorinus also combated the heresy of Eunomius and didn't make any appeal to the word energie, unlike the Cappadocians. Preferring a different form of argumentation, Marius also showed forth the fallacious thinking of Eunomius. If anyone is interested in hearing more about this, then I direct the listener to my video titled the essence and energy distinction in the West. A lot of issues had already been decided, um, including that uh, council in 1244, I think I mentioned this in my book, that was um, condemning the view that the divine 
essence, essentia, is be held uh, or known. I forget the word that's used, but I quote this. Yeah, yeah. Um, neither in this life or the afterlife. Okay, which um, they're associating with Eryugena and maybe with some of the Arab peripatetics. Um, but Eryugena got it right from Maximus um, and Gregory of Nyssa, in fact. Um, the thing that happened, of course, was he took what they said about the Usia and translated into Latin using the word essentia. And that's where, at that point, it begins to sound heretical to Latin ears. Um, well, anyway, for that, that canonical decision was already made by the time Aquinas began writing. So he's bound by that. Here's where Dr. Bradshaw and I have an obvious different understanding of both the Cappadocians and the great theologian Maximus the Confessor. When I read St. Gregory of Nyssa, it is not clear to me that he rejects a kind of beholding of the divine essence. In his infamous homilies on the Song of Songs, Nyssa refers to the usia of God as a perfume which draws the faithful out of themselves and into the domain of faith. It is certain that, for Nyssa, there is no sight of the divine essence insofar as being an object by the natural powers of sensation or intellection. But what is not clear is how faith, in a certain sense, can bring one to the unknown as present. What is also clear in Nyssa's work against Eunomius is that the energies in some sense come under the power of the reasoning faculty, considering the term's disposition gives them degrees of greater than and lesser than. While the divine essence is untouched by any power naturally inherent within the angelic hierarchy and humanity alike. Now when it comes to the binding of Aquinas on the site of the divine essence, there is some truth to this, but it's not as clear cut as it seems. In the early 13th century, there was quite a heated intellectual battle as the writings of the Greek fathers began to be widely circulated among the Latins. The heart of the battle was among the Victorines in the neighboring areas. Alexander of Hales, Hugh of St. Victor, William of Auvergne, and Albert the Great were a few of those who were pivotal characters. At the end of the day, those who longed for the full vision of God were satisfied at the condemnation of what was called by many Oriental theology. But the East was not altogether abandoned or dismissed. Doctors of the church such as Albert the Great sought out a way to maintain something of the East position in synthesis with the Catholic ruling. It was through his spirit that Aquinas received and passed along his affinity for the East. Lastly, it's important to note that Aquinas' formulation of the beatific vision does not win out by default. In fact, his own teacher, Albert the Great, had a different understanding of what that sight entailed, which some from the East might appreciate a little more. And yet both remain in the domain of orthodoxy while espousing different formulations of what the sight of the essence means. If doc Dr. Bradshaw looked into the different understandings of the beatific vision, I think he would be pleasantly surprised. Um, and in some cases, this light. Like Proclus. Um, so, so it also, his, his doctrine of simplicity always, he, and Thomas, clear that Thomas definitely has doctrinal differences with someone like Dionysius. I mean, you definitely see him gently correcting Dion what Dionysius really means to say when he says this. Yes, you, de you definitely see him gently correcting. So I think there are real metaphysical uh, differences. Um, however, I would, th there are two questions is, um, should, should Thomas's uh, metaphysics or construal be cons understood as simply Augustinian, number one? And number two, um, what's sort of the cash value of those uh, metaphysical differences in terms of theological, in terms of uh, sort of the theological confession of the faith? So I guess, um, so it's clear that Thomas thinks that, say, Theos or um, Lord are essential names. They're named from operations, but names of the essence. 
right? And not just names of the operations while the essence remains unnameable. That's, that's not Thomas's position. That is the Greek father's position. They're not the same, right? Um, mm -hmm. However, Thomas doesn't simply say that um, we have a name for God. So he's not going to simply say that um, like God, like, like a word like God or um, like a word like God or Lord or wisdom or power or justice or mercy or any of those names, actually, um, though they though they name the divine essence, uh, their their res significata, the thing that they signify, what he says, uh, um, is the divine essence. And in that sense, they're essential names. But their modus significandi, the way they signify, is different. And he explains that in terms of his idea that the, the sort of what he calls this threefold way, where he says, um, we can name God from his operations, uh, because you know things act as they are, but since God transcends the world, you know we have to deny um, what we know of them from creatures and apply them in a super eminent way. So that um, when we say that God is mercy or God is goodness or God is theos, I guess God is God, um, or uh, something, we don't quite know what we're what we're what we're saying, you know. And in that sense, the divine essence really does remain unnameable in Thomas's position. Um, and so in that sense, he's making um, a difference with respect to Augustine. Um, we mentioned that um, the idea that um, the divine essence uh, itself is not beheld as a, um, as a point of condemnation. And it's actually true. Thomas actually himself gets in trouble with this. Thomas knows this position from John Chrysostom, actually. So John Chrysostom has a set of uh, sermons on the incomprehensibility of God. And, and John Chrysostom kind of even sort of says this. And Thomas, again, has to do one of these, well, you know, what he really means to say is. Um, but so, so the question is, there's, there's kind of a, a, a real difference in metaphysical doctrine here. But again, um, the Greek fathers aren't going to want to say, at least I don't, I don't think, that they're going to want to say that, like, you know, there's a sense in which we don't participate in like the fullness of God. You know what I mean? Like, like, mm -hmm. you know, from his fullness, we have all received grace mm -hmm. upon grace. It's just that the fullness that we receive never can exhaust the infinite essence. But that Okay. There was a lot packed into there. First of all, I just want to touch upon the comment that Father Tottleben made in regards to Aquinas and St. Dionysius. I don't think Aquinas would personally agree with Father Peter's characterizing him as someone who sought to take corrective measures against the Areopagite. I've never gotten this sense once when reading Aquinas. Instead, I think Aquinas had a certain philosophical vision that he sought to harmonize not by correcting apparent opposition, but rather by bending to greater conformity with his own theological and philosophical convictions. Now, when it comes to St. John Chrysostom, I do not read Aquinas as either one, correcting him, or two, even, even having a reason to correct him. It's curious to me that the very same work Father Tottleben mentioned is the same work where Chrysostom actually gives the greatest clarity on what he means, which clarity makes him very compatible with Catholic doctrine instead of in opposition to it. When Chrysostom writes against the Enomians, or the Anomians, he finds himself reflecting upon the saying of Christ, namely, where he says, Nobody knows the Son but the Father, and nobody knows the Father but the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Chrysostom is absolutely clear that knowing for the Son means having that inexpressible perfect apprehension of the divine essence. To see, according to Chrysostom, is to have perfect knowledge of something. In this sense, Chrysostom and Catholics alike should both reject that anyone sees the divine essence. Nevertheless, the Son does will to reveal it as incomprehensible, and this is what Chrysostom calls seeing it without complete exactness. If anyone wants to look further into this, then I suggest reading his fourth and fifth homily found on his book called On the Incomprehensible Nature of God. Um, the real question then, I think, boils down to um, 
can the energies be seen as something with a distinct referent, reference than uh, the divine essence? And I think that um, in that sense, um, they can't. Um, and that would be that would be sort of the distinction uh, that I would draw. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the transfiguration, I don't think. Okay, I want to take a minute to compare what Father Peter just said with the actual tomos from the Palamite councils. Rather than summarize, I will just read the passage verbatim. This comes from the first Palamite council held in 1351. Quote, According to the theologians, this movement of God belongs to his essence and nature. We say that it proceeds and flows forth from the divine essence as from an eternal wellspring, and it does this without ever being perceived to do so, but always remains undivided from it, coexisting from eternity with the divine essence, and being inseparably united with it. Nor can it ever be divided by any eternal or temporal or local interval from the divine essence, but timelessly and pre-eternally proceeds and continuously coexists with it. And the divine Anastasius, among the saints whom the Holy and Ecumenical Synod commemorated under the title The Great, says in his second discourse about the uncircumscribed, quote, We know the heretics refrain from saying such things about God. They, the heretics that is, say that God is in all things by energy, but is nowhere by essence, designating as energy the final product of energy. I, for my part, would say that God's energy is inseparable from his essence. Where the energy is deemed to be, the essence is also contemplated with it. Close quote. It is clear from this little snippet of the council alone that the issue Father Tottleman raises is not an existing issue. The essential energy of the divine essence is no more separable from the essence than intellection is from the intellect, or sensation from the senses. The motions which flow forth from the divine essence are not to be conceived of as something present somewhere that the divine essence is not. Again, no essence is separable from its essential energy apart from which it is no longer existing. Whoever says contrary to this, the council clearly declares to be in heresy. It's, it's not clear to me. I've tried reading John of Damascus' sermon like a bunch of times, and it's not clear to me that he's saying that literally, um, he's not, it, it, I can't see him saying that like, the physical light that's perceived by the corporeal eye of the body is um, is itself uncreated. Uh, speculatively. So this section where the dialogue shifts to focus on the transfiguration is for me the most important. The Palamite position has this narrative at the heart of its theological system, and if it can't be undermined, then the system is solid. Now, before we dive in, I just want to say by way of preamble that for those of you who would like a deeper reflection on the historical narrative, I have a video dedicated specifically to the development of the Transfiguration narrative in the East. I encourage everyone with a deep interest in this dialogue to check the video out. With that being said, I would like to continue our review by saying that I cannot in good conscience join Father Tottleben in his reluctance to admit the Damascene's position in regards to the light of Tabor. For starters, John of Damascus sets the scene in his homily in such a way that doesn't allow for a severing of noetic light from the body in which and through which it shined. It is clear that, for St. John, that the light unfolded from within the body of Christ. He makes this very clear in his homily when he writes as follows, quote, the glory was not added to the body from without, but came from within, from the supremely divine divinity of the word united hypostatically with it in an ineffable manner. Close quote. From here, the doctor of the church builds upon his opening with greater precision and clarity. 
a clarity which, to me, cannot be construed in any other way. That light for the Damascene is the eternal in hypostatic glory. And this glory was, quote, beheld by human eyes, close quote, and truly shine from Christ's sacred body. Ask, you know, what is an uncreated photon? Um, and and um, is it really, and, 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 and if what the eye of the body is perceiving isn't actually a photon, but something else, is it the actually the eye of the body that's doing the perceiving? So I don't think that there's a question in the trans... I think what Father Talbin just stated for us to consider is reflective of a deep lack of vision in Western Christology. Bringing down the transfiguration to the scrutiny of mere human reasoning is a common temptation in the West. For the East, however, the transfiguration narrative is expressed as a kind of epicenter of all Christian mystical experience. The super-essential light flowing forth from Christ's body transfigured not only the eyes of the soul, but even the eyes of the body to perceive with one simple light the ineffable luminosity of the divine nature. Whether we read from St. Macarius of Egypt, or John the theologian, or St. Ephraim the Syrian, the light which reached in through both the intellect and physical eyes was one divine reality above sensation or intellection. The East, unlike the West, had a clear answer for the question that Augustine pondered so deeply in his City of God, Book 22, and in his infamous 147th letter to Paulina. Will the saints behold God with their physical eyes? When Augustine pondered this question, he did not bring God's divinity down and speak about corporeal light, but rather he considered God lifting the body up and enriching its sight, even though he didn't have a good philosophical argument for this. It is true that Augustine didn't seem to have much hope that the body will see God with its physical eyes. Nevertheless, he remained open to the possibility as expressed in his writings. So then, how did the East solve the question? It's simple in language, but deep in thought. God suspends the natural activity or energy of the senses to bring them to rest, and the intellect to shine through their natural powers and manifest himself in and through them. The transfiguration narrative was not photons passing into an eye. No, it's the whole human person asleep to nature and transfigured with the ineffable divine ray. There's a lot more to unpack in this, which we will reflect upon more deeply in the next video. But in short, the idea of reducing the light to a photon in the East eyes is tantamount to dismissing the apex of all mystical experiences. Um, that's not um, out of line with what Thomas would say in some other positions. So, so when Thomas talks about the beatific vision, for example, he would talk about the way that, you know, we have a noetic experience of God's glory. You know, we experience the glory of God through knowledge and through love. Uh, but nevertheless, um, our bodies, uh, the, the heavenly, the glory of God flows from our souls into our bodies, glorifying our bodies, and our bodies need to have their own proper glory. So like our bodies, behold, in the beatific vision, the humanity of Christ, much like the apostles behold the humanity of Christ on Mount Tabor. And uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, 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 the physical light that the eye of the body beholds is the proper good and the delight of the eye. So, right, so there's, there's, there, 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 there are created and uncreated aspects of participation. Uh, the body, uh, the body in heavenly glory by beholding uh, the Savior gets the delight of the, 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 you know, the, the, the delight that's proper to the eye of the body, which would be created. It would be a photon, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, there can also be a noetic participation through the spiritual elevation of the soul, 
uh, you know, produced by the energies of God acting on the soul to deify it. Okay, there was a lot packed in there, but I'm only going to comment by saying this. Aquinas nowhere in any of his works speaks of the light itself as created. I know of many who read into Aquinas' conclusion, but it's important to note that he remained rather agnostic on the question. Also, the position that Father Tottleben is putting forth about the delight of the eyes being the photons of the light is not to be found in Aquinas either. I speculate that if Aquinas were present today and had access to the writings of the Eastern Patrimony, that he would have delighted in their articulation of the resurrected body delighting in the same object as the soul, namely, God himself. I truly believe that Aquinas, above all the Eastern scholastics, or excuse me, above all scholastics, revered the East and truly saw their fathers as our fathers. And as such, we should eagerly follow his spirit. the sun and its rays, uh, does God really have to shine a ray onto something uh, in order to create it, right? And so a Thomist is going to say that... Okay. Thomas and Palamites both agree on this point. Gregory Palamas himself states very clearly that God is always an act in the sense that no new actuality obtains in him in virtue of his relation to his creatures. It's the creature that stands in potency to God and not God to creatures. God transfigures creation and creatures do not change God. Now it is true that God is not distant to any one of us. He doesn't need to reach out, so to speak, in order to draw out of us his own likeness. But the question still isn't whether he needs to or not, but does he? From the beginning of our Genesis in the first book of the Torah to the end of the last verse in Revelation, God demonstrates his unique relationship with humanity. A relationship so unique that he even went out of himself within himself to assume our nature into his very own hypostasis and then endowed it with his own natural glory. Well, that is going to wrap up this video. I want to thank you all for watching this first review for Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. Please feel free to leave thoughts and comments below. To those of you who are wondering, it will still be some time before the final video on the essence energy distinction is complete. I really want to take my time to be as thorough and complete as possible. So thank you all for your continued prayers and support. Until next time, God bless.